idea of, oh, I should go connect with people, I should network with people. Well, I'm here to tell you that there's a science behind that. Yes, I know, it's going to be a little bit boring, but I'll, you stay with me. It's going to get interesting. We're going to talk about how we can organize revolutions, how we can um, position ourselves such that we get more wealth and power, right? Who doesn't want wealth and power? Um, I want wealth and power. Um, so, um, so the, what happened was information technology caught up. We have big computers now, and so we have this discipline called network science. where what we do is we represent phenomena in the social um, sciences and physical sciences and technology with respect to networks. And we try to study them and we try to understand them and build predictive models of them. So networks, complex networks, are everywhere. One of them are, uh, one group is technological networks, where, for example, the internet is a global system of interconnected networks or the power grid is another technological network. The other category is information networks. The web is a network of web pages that link to each other. Or here you have the map of science where we are interested in seeing how different disciplines in science cite each other. So over here is the, uh, the pink is my discipline. And over here, social sciences and humanity is my husband's discipline. We don't cite each other. There's no reason, really. <laughs> then there's social sciences, like the friendship network on Facebook, and email communication networks. And finally, there are biological networks, like how proteins interact with each other, or in an ecosystem, who eats whom. We're interested in finding that. And if I was in such an ecosystem, I would want to know who's going to eat me. So, one idea that we work on is social capital. Suppose you were this ego up there, and that's your local social network, and you go to a meeting, and you meet two other uh, people, and they ask you to be their friend. And you accept their friendship requests. What happens to your social capital? Do you know? The fact that you have accepted their friendship requests could change your social network both locally, which it does, obviously, and globally. By connecting to these two people, in some sense your social capital has gone up. The reason is that now you're at, you have access to novel, new information that before you weren't getting. So in a sense of being a broker, your social capital has gone up. But of course you can't trust these new social networks. You don't have as much connections to them. So what happens when you make these links, you're filling what's known as structural holes. There's this professor, Professor Ron Burke, at University of Chicago's School of Business. It's called Booth School of Business. He's a great speaker. I highly recommend you guys watching his talks. He has studied this a lot, and he has found out that people who fill these structural holes get more wealth and power. So knowing your social network, knowing whether I should accept this friendship request or this, this connection, how will that affect my social network is what you should worry about. In particular, in the next slide, you'll see that there's this guy, Robert, and he fills structural holes. And Robert, the probability of him getting an outstanding evaluation is a lot higher than James. James has a higher probability in getting a poor evaluation. Robert gets promoted earlier, and Robert gets bigger bonuses. Robert is in a position where he connects different people to each other. Now, one question here that we do not know is that is there a causal relationship between filling structural holes and getting more power and wealth? We don't know that. Maybe people like Robert have, are just overachievers. Or maybe they have high emotional intelligence, as we heard earlier on. We don't know if there's a causal relationship there, but there is definitely high correlation. So we all want to be Robert, right? We want more power, we want more wealth. We want access to novel information. Next, I'm going to talk about sources of uh, social correlation. And the reason is, if you know the sources of your social correlation, you can save yourself a lot of money. That's good too. So 
there are three sources of social correlation. I'm going to talk about two of them. One is this idea of peer pressure or social influence. And the other is homophily. So peer pressure, we all know what it is, is I'm going to change my behavior to be more like my friends. Right? So if my friends are smoking pot, I'm going to smoke pot, right? Because I want to be more like them. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that is peer, peer pressure and social influence. I don't know. But I'm just saying. Right? The other one is homophily. This idea of that birds of a feather flock together. And it's an idea that's been around for a very, very long time. Plato said similarity begets friendship, right? So this idea that you and I will be friends because we are very similar, right? Andy and I are going to be friends because we both like computer science, because we're both computer science geeks. We like iPads and stuff like playing games, you know, hours and hours. So, but, and actually a couple of years ago, there were all these studies, we were inundated that everything is peer pressure. Obesity is peer pressure. Watch out with your friends, because if your friends are obese, there's 57% chance more that you're going to be obese too. Or happiness is, is, is contagious. Um, depression, loneliness, everything is a contagion. Since then, we figured out that everything is not contagious. Everything is not social influence. And that there's actually a mix of them between peer influence and homophily. That real world networks have both of them, and that we should try to measure both of them. Now, again, why is this important? Suppose that you want to promote a product, or you want to promote communication, as one of our speakers was talking about, right? You want to promote a good health outcome. You want people to use condoms. So, if you know that in your social network, promoting condom use is falls more within peer pressure, then you want to use viral marketing. You do not want to do targeted outreach. But if you know that with respect to condom use, you, it's more homophily, birds of a feather flock together, then you want to do targeted outreach, right? So, and this will save you a lot of money and a lot of time. So network scientists study models of network diffusion. We want to know how fast information goes through a network. We want to know how much of the network do we reach. Important things to know, especially if, if you want to spread something like a revolution. How many of you, I know this is sponsored by the International Student Association, have lived in an oppressive society? I have. How would you organize a revolution? Why is it that these dictators hate social media? Right? Suppose that you find out that tomorrow there is a demonstration, and if a lot of people show up, the government's legitimacy will fall, will go down, will be damaged. But if a lot of people don't show up, then you're going to get arrested. You're going to get your ass kicked. Right? And it was better to stay home and not go out. So if the majority of your friends were going to go, then you should go, right? You should go with the majority. Now, the reason, one of the reasons that dictators don't like social media, because they rely on mass ignorance. This idea of that people are happy. Most people are happy. Most people are not going to show up, right? But then I go on, on Twitter, I go on Facebook, and I hear all these people saying, I'm going to show up, I'm going to be there. I'm like, oh, wow, this looks like the majority of people are going to be there. So I'm going to go there. Right? So this idea that first nobody's going to show up, then two people are going to show up, then the idea keeps spreading because the majority of the people are going to go to this demonstration. And then the next thing you know, you have Tunisia, you have Egypt. Maybe next we'll have Iran. So I personally got interested in link analysis um, a while back when my colleagues and I started studying um, networks, and we wanted to do link prediction, what's called link prediction. We wanted 90% accuracy, who you will connect to next. And we have ran it in many, many, many different social networks and other kinds of networks. And then one other thing that we did was we wanted to know what's the influence of somebody in a network. And in particular, let's suppose you have a communication network, right? And we wanted to see if ego called B will D answer, the phone. And you would think, well, D is in power, right? Ego's calling him, 
they can choose not to pick up the phone, right? But what we found out was that the most predictive feature was about ego, not about Z. If ego, if most of ego's calls were answered, then Z would answer. It didn't matter where Z was, when it was, he would answer because an influential person was calling him. Imagine if you are in the United States President's social network and he were to call you, you're going to pick up the phone. I would pick up the phone, right? So, and then I just want to finish up with this one thing. I heard that Facebook is evil, right? Facebook isn't evil. Ignorance is evil, right? The reason people get into trouble in Facebook is because different communities that never would see each other, will ever talk to each other, are coming together because of you, right? The way I would talk with my high school uh, buddies is not the same way I would talk to the chairman of my department, but they're both on my Facebook social network, right? So I, shouldn't, I should watch out what I say. If I want to say something to my high school buddies, maybe I should email them. Maybe I shouldn't put it on Facebook, right? So I, I encourage you to get educated about these social networks. Just don't accept people's friendships, right? Or if you accept them, think about it, right? Or in LinkedIn, less maybe, because people usually don't post things that are uh, embarrassing on LinkedIn. But definitely get educated. It's not evil to be on Facebook. There are privacy issues, for sure, right, in, on all these things. And one of, the, one of the ideas that's out there right now, um, and this is an idea by Professor Pentland at MIT, is a new deal on data. That all the data I generate is mine. And if I tell Facebook, theoretically, they would erase it all. Right, theoretically. So, and then, but they can give me incentives to do what they want with my data. For example, they can say, you know, we'll give you $100 if you give us this aspect of your data, right? These parts of your data. And if they give me a million dollars, I would give their data, my data to them, no problem. Do whatever you want with it, right? But we be up to these things, right? Study them, become educated about them. It will do you good. It will get you wealth, it will get you power, it will get you connections. And maybe you can start a revolution. Thank you.